Wow, this brings back memories. I remember when I was shooting a television show called Flipside, and I kept getting notes every week. Probably written by Gene Simmons, they were handwritten, and they included backstage passes to see Kiss, whoever Kiss was. Well, after I finished shooting the 13 weeks of the show, I decided maybe I'd have more fun in the music business. So I decided to go see this group, Kiss. And one night, an advertising executive and myself traveled over to the Diplomat Hotel. Yes, the famous Diplomat, kind of a rundown hotel. We worked our way around the holes and sat down in the front row. Well, this was different, all right. Kiss came out. They had black jeans on, a few studs, had some firelights, and some smoke. They used smoke even then. Well, we listened to this group called KISS with their partial makeup. They didn't have all the makeup yet, but they had part of it. And said, well, this is certainly different. They are certainly performers. They definitely were performers. And next to me was a young girl screaming and hollering and telling me how great they were. They're wonderful. Oh, you've got to sign them. This group is great. They're my favorite. I found out later it was Peter's sister. But in any case, I left that night after speaking to Paul and Jean and told them we should get together in a week or so and discuss their career. A few days later, they came up to my office and we discussed what we could do. I said, you know, why don't you give me a chance? At least give me 30 days. I'll see if I can get your record deal and then we can decide whether we're going to stay together or not. They agreed. And within those 30 days, I had talked to Neil Bogart. Neil Bogart had done one of my television shows. And I knew him pretty well, and I also knew he was leaving Buddha Records to start a new record company, soon to be called Casablanca. So Neil was looking for talent. I said I saw a unique band, a little over the top, wore makeup, but they were very persistent, very exciting, and I thought it could work. Neil said, well, do you have any tapes? I said, well, I'll get, I'll get you a demo and see what you think. Sure enough, they brought a demo to the office. The demo was done by Eddie Kramer. Very good demo. Had a lot of good songs, songs that all of you know, like Firehouse and Strutter and Black Diamond. Anyway, I brought it to, to Neil, and Neil gave it to a couple of his producers. The two producers at, at Buddha then were Kenny Kerner and Richie Wise, and they had recorded a number of hits for him at Buddha, and they were going to travel to L.A. to be part of the new record label, the new record label called Casablanca. Anyway, he brought it to them, and he said, Look it, what do you think? If you like them, I think we'll sign this group. Well, both Richie and Kenny were rock and rollers and and loved the idea of recording a rock and roll band, even though they didn't know about the makeup and what crazies they were. Well, eventually, Neil said they would sign them. I told the guys, and within 30 days, we had a record deal, and we proceeded to do the album. When we were signed to Casablanca, Casablanca was backed by Warner Brothers Records. And when they first got a load of what Neil had signed, i.e. the KISS band with the makeup, they weren't really sure. In fact, they were positive that KISS wouldn't make it. So after the album was done, there was a memo passed around Warner Brothers that maybe they shouldn't quite think about working this band. After all, how could a band with makeup make it? And they'd probably be gone soon. So just avoid working the band. Well, this memo got in the hands of Neil Bogart, one of, his, one of his friends at Warner's tipped him off, and he went crazy. He just didn't like that at all. How dare they go against him? So he had a meeting with the executives at Warner's and said, look it, how can you work against me on this new label? They said, look it, Neil, I don't, we don't, really don't believe that this KISS group can make it. Why don't you just look for some other artist? Neil said no, but he did call me one night before he made his final decision to leave Warners and said, look, Warners does not want the group with makeup. Do you think you'd go and ask them if they would take their makeup off? I told Neil I didn't think so, but I had a meeting with the group and told him what was happening, and we all agreed that we couldn't possibly do it. Called back Neil and said, Neil, look, we're not going to take off the makeup. Neil then proceeded talking to Warner Brothers about whether or not... he. They would go along with the KISS project. They said they didn't feel it was right, and Neil said, would you let me out of my contract? They worked out a deal to let Neil out of his contract. There was only one problem, though. There wasn't any money. That was a real problem. Neil had to mortgage his home just to keep the company going. And this is where this famous American Express story comes in. Seeing there was no money, I decided to put the tour on my American Express card. Well, I wasn't used to putting any more than about $100 on my American Express card, and in one month it was $25,000. I can still remember the call. 
Mr. O'Coin, do you think you're going to pay this? You seem to have used your American Express card quite a lot this month. Oh, of course, I said. Well, of course, I couldn't. But fortunately, they allowed me to pay it over a period of months. And we finally got through the tour and finally got more money into the company. One of the scariest things that happened happened with the first show the KISS did for Casablanca and O'Coin Management. It was at the Academy of Music. Well, we had put the show together and we had pyrotechnics, we had a candelabra, Gene was spitting fire, we had smoke, and we also had little balls of flash paper, which Gene would go to the candelabra and then throw up in the air and they would just light and explode in the air. Well, the first night Gene was so nervous that when he took the flash paper, instead of throwing it up in the air, he threw it into the audience. And oh my gosh, it hit one of the guys sitting in the first row. A real rock and roller, but he was singed. This was rather scary. We thought he might have been terribly hurt or burned. Uh, We thought maybe it might have been the end of their career, not the beginning of the career. He turned out to be a true rock and roller, and from that point on, he got free tickets to all the Kiss shows. One of the unique things about the first album uh, was was the idea that we were going to do a kissing contest. Neil had thought up a promotion that would that would be unique uh, in promoting Kiss and the name Kiss, and that was to have a kissing contest at all the major radio stations around the country. So he put up the money to promote this uh, the the kissing contest, and then needed something on record to promote the kissing contest, and needed something to promote it on radio came up with the idea that that we would do the song Kissing Time, which had been a hit record many years before, uh, of which none of us really wanted to do it, especially Kiss, who thought it was a little too popish and certainly wasn't their type of music. But Neil persisted, and we knew we had to go along with it. After all, this was the promotion of the first record that they had ever done. So we went back into the studio and cut Kissing Time. Kissing Time was promoted in every radio station across the country, along with the Kiss Contests. The Kissing Contest turned out to be very successful. We're not sure how much it promoted Kiss, but it certainly got enough Kissing Contests around the country so that the radio stations knew who Casablanca was, which enabled us to to get some airplay. But most radio stations didn't like the idea of Kiss, their songs, or their makeup. After Dress to Kill, a couple of special things happened. One happened with a town in in Michigan called Cadillac, Michigan. And Michigan was a big breakout area for KISS. We had a lot of fans there. And in Cadillac, Michigan High School, they would play KISS music in the halftime during the football games. And when they did, they always won the game. And I got a call from the coach one day and said, you know, the morale is down in the school a bit and everything. Do you think KISS might be able to come out here? It would really be great. and It would kind of symbolize everything and all the winning games we had. And I said, well, it's a possibility, but we have to do something special if that's going to happen. Do you think people would put on the KISS makeup? Do you think everyone would wear KISS makeup, something like that? And, and he said, well, we could talk about it. And finally we talked about it enough that, that everyone agreed that that's what would happen. We'd have KISS Day at the high school. And so we sent directions out to them on how to put KISS makeup, and we got all sorts of makeup to send to the high school so everyone could do it. We got a little film crew together to go out and shoot it, thinking it might be something that was unique. We got to Cadillac, Michigan, and lo and behold, the whole high school was in KISS makeup. But not just the high school kids. The teachers were in KISS makeup. The principal was in KISS makeup. And it was quite amazing. And some of the police were in KISS makeup. The firemen were in KISS makeup. They had changed the names of the streets. And so we went, we went through the streets of Cadillac, Michigan, with, on top of fire trucks and with everyone along the side, not everyone, but most of the people along the sides of the streets in KISS makeup. One of the strangest moments was the next morning when we had a breakfast with the mayor and one of the councilmen and one of the senators from the state. And we walked into this breakfast restaurant, and my gosh, The mayor was in KISS makeup. The mayor's wife was in KISS makeup. The senator was in KISS makeup. It was quite a breakfast. Turned out to be one of the most exciting days. And that breakfast, we were also presented with the key to Cadillac, Michigan. And we left Cadillac, Michigan from the football field in a helicopter. No one really knew that the helicopter only flew for about five minutes because that's all we could afford to do. It kind of went over the trees and landed in the parking lot, and we got out and got into cars and left for New York. The next Kiss Adventure came with a live album, 
an exciting moment because it was not only the album that finally broke Kiss, but there were other things that happened. During the recording of the live album, we realized that we had not gotten any royalty statements from the record company. And I knew as a manager it was my obligation to follow through and to get that done. And when we weren't receiving them, I had to go to our lawyers and kind of threaten the record label on what would happen if they didn't come through with the royalties for KISS. Now, we had a great relationship with the record label, but this is something that had to be done. And during this time, the record label actually went to KISS and tried to take over the management of KISS. But KISS decided to stay with me, and we had a long run together. Many other things happened during that time, too. Other labels were trying to get KISS, knowing that we might break up with Casablanca. But we then re-signed with Casablanca and had our first major hit, Kiss Alive. Uh, Kiss Alive tour was very interesting. We finally broke out of Detroit uh, playing Cobo Hall on a major concert. And after the live tour ended in the States, we went to Europe for the first time. Rather scary for the four guys. They had never been to Europe. Uh, it was quite a change of pace. We got to London, and they realized that everything closed up early, that uh, the television stations didn't have the shows that they wanted to see. Not only didn't they have the shows, but it went off the air at 11 o'clock. You can imagine the four of them at 11.15 climbing the walls, not being able to eat, not being able to watch television. It was a little crazy, and I think the first day they got there, they wanted to return to the States. Paul Stanley. Well, Paul, Paul is the musical backbone of the group, and he really is. Um, probably more of a writer, producer, and obviously you know he's the singer. Uh, he's, uh, there were many things that have happened uh, with Paul. Uh, when I first met Paul, Paul was a little overweight. And I know you don't think of Paul like that today because he's always taking good care of himself. But he was a little overweight, a little chubby. And uh, when we went on the first road tour back in 74... He got sick in Atlanta, and he got the flu, and it lasted for a few days. And he lost about 10 pounds. I'll never forget this. He, and he called me, and he said, Bill, I really look good now. He said, I'm never going to put that weight on again. And he never did. He really kept himself in great shape. The one thing I never could understand about Paul is uh, every time we went to Los Angeles, he would lose his voice. And I suspect it was probably the stress. You know, you know you're going to Los Angeles. You're going to be playing for thousands and thousands of people, including lots of celebrities and everything else. But we always used to lose Paul's voice. Somewhere in Los Angeles it used to go. And uh, what we used to have to do is have a, a throat specialist come, and we used to freeze his vocal cords before the show because he used to get laryngitis. And uh, before, before every show, we would freeze his vocal cords, and it would last for about half hour, 45 minutes, and he would come off the stage and would have to do it again so he could get through the show. I remember one time when we were touring Australia and New Zealand, we had gotten to New Zealand, and Paul was going out with a famous actress from Hollywood who was shooting a movie on the other side of the island, New Zealand, quite a few hours away. And he came in to me one night and he said, uh, you know, I really would like to see her, Bill. We have a couple of days and and uh, what do you think I should do? How do you think I can see her? I said, well, you know, I, I guess you could rent a jet. And uh, we thought it back and forth and talked about it for a bit. And Paul finally decided he'd rent a jet and he'd fly down to see her. Well, when Paul went to see her, he wanted to make a big entrance. So what he did is he asked the pilot of the jet to fly over the shooting area where they were shooting the movie. So he buzzed her a couple of times and everything, and then they went and landed the jet. What he didn't know further was that they had to stop all shooting, and the director was absolutely beside himself. This kind of this nut that was flying around over their heads while they were trying to shoot a movie. They had to stop shooting it that afternoon, and of course the actress found out it was Paul coming to see her to spend an evening. You know, I just remembered a story. I know that when I used to go up to their rooms in a hotel, I never knew quite what was going to happen to me when I walked through the door, whether I was going to step in a bucket of water or whether a bucket was going to fall on my head and I'd be soaked. And Paul was famous for this. You never really knew. The first time we went to Japan, it was rather unique because we had convinced Pan American Airways to give us a 747. Now you can imagine going to Kennedy Airport in New York and seeing your 747 waiting for you. It was renamed and painted the Clipper Kiss Special. Well, I mean, it was just unbelievable. 
And on top of it, we took all the press with us as well. So we had the KISS group and all the management people, as well as a lot of press. We filled up the plane with press to take them to Japan. There were a lot of things that happened around that. There was also a freighter, an air freighter, another Pan American 707 that had to carry the KISS stage. Now, the group had been on tour, and they had not seen this KISS stage before because it was built and designed by Kenny Anderson, who was, who was ahead of our uh, production department at O'Coin Management. And it was put on a, on a freighter to be sent to Japan so that when they arrived at Japan, they would see it for the first time set up. Well, a little quirk that happened at the airport in upstate New York was the set turned out to be a lot heavier than we had expected. So when they loaded it on the plane, we had to make a decision. We either had to leave part of the set home or we had to come up with another solution. Well, fortunately, the two pilots who flew it to Tokyo decided that they would fly the plane unpressurized and have to wear oxygen masks all the way to Tokyo so that the weight of the plane could handle the KISS set. Tokyo was kind of unique, um, unusual, obviously a completely different culture, but we had lots of fans there. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fans at the airport, and we, had, we didn't realize that we were going to have a little problem at the airport. We actually put all our makeup on, you know, on the plane, on the, Kiss, uh, the Clipper Kiss special, and when we arrived, they walked out of the 747, and there was a wall of photographers from floor to ceiling. They had put up ladders and chairs and everything, and they just couldn't even get by them. And as we finally got by the photographers, uh, the customs people came to us and said, uh, who are these people? We said, well, with a kiss. Said, well, no, no, no. They said, but this doesn't look like what they look on their passport. And, of course, we then had to go into a room and take off their makeup, which was really a hard job after just putting it back on again and then they had to put it on once more to leave the terminal where there were thousands of kids waiting for them outside. Kiss's Budokan concert was very successful thousands and thousands of fans and it was the first time that they were ever broadcast nationally by doing a television special directly from the Budokan. Here's an interesting story on kind of unusual. I, I, I left New York to go out on tour with the guys for a few days and I arrive in, in, in a city, I can't tell you which city it was because there were so many cities we were always in, but I, I come from the airport and I finally arrive backstage at the arena and I see someone running into the arena as I arrive. I'm saying, oh, something's up. It's almost as though he was tipping them off that I was coming. And so I go to the arena door and I walk in and everyone's a little quiet. I still don't know what's happening. I'm walking backstage and on the side of the stage... I hear this vocal group, but it's led by a woman, not by the guys, but I hear this backup group. I turn the corner, and who's there but Gracie Slick singing with four backup people that I didn't recognize at first, but of course, who were they? They were Kiss and Drag. Yes, Paul Stanley went out and bought dresses for each one of the guys, and they decided they were going to be the backup group for Gracie Slick. Well, Gracie was on the tour because she was going out with our lighting director, who she eventually married. But this was quite a day. And I walked in, and there they were, four KISS members in full drag, backing up Gracie Slick, singing me a song and serenading me as I walked into the arena. That didn't last long. They started racing after me. I think they had an extra dress, but I wasn't sure. Ace Fraley. Ace Fraley is truly an original. Uh, sweetheart. Uh, probably would take the shirt off his back for you. A kidder and an all-around fun guy to be around. Ace, I'll tell you one story that Ace, Ace played on uh, Gene and Paul. I think it was in Kansas City. I'm not quite sure. But in any case, I get a call from Gene and Paul on the road, and I'm in New York. And they tell me that Ace had been drinking, and he, he's just so out of his mind that he won't be able to do the show that night. And they're very upset. Oh, my, what are we going to do about the fans, the promoter, the this, the that? You're going to have to come right out. So I go to the airport. I get on a plane. I arrive, and Gene and Paul are waiting for me, and they're telling me these horror stories about Ace. Oh, my goodness, we've got to carry him into the hotel. He won't be able to stand up. Never mind about playing the show. We'll never do it. I said, okay, let me go and see what's happening, and I... Asked the road manager where he was. He's up in his room. Okay. So I go up to the room. I knock on the door. I say, Asifer. I always used to call him Asifer. So. And he said, oh, Bill, come on in. So I go in, and Ace is sitting at a table, reading a book, having a beer. 
Now, I know something's wrong, because if he's really out of his mind, he'd be laying down out of it someplace. So uh, I say, hi, Ace, what's happening? You know, oh, oh, oh well, I, I just kind of getting, you know, Gene and Paul. I mean, you know, it's about time I could play a trick on them. So anyway, so we go through this whole thing, and I realize he's done them in. He's been, he's been fooling them all day long, the road crew. He's talked the road crew into having to carry him into the hotel, and, you know, he's, he's done this up just right. So they're really upset. I'm all the way out there from New York, so Ace and I decide, okay, we'll carry this through just a little bit longer. In any case, we tell the, the road manager to tell Gene and Paul, don't worry, we'll somehow get Ace there. We don't know how. We'll stand him up and get him to the sound check. Don't worry about it. You go to the sound check. Somehow we'll get Ace there. Meanwhile, Ace and I get it together, sneak out of the back door of the hotel, and go to the sound check, get all his amps set up properly. And by the time Gene and Paul gets there, they're already he's already playing and, and out on stage and rehearsing the material. So they finally knew they'd finally been had. And, uh, but that was Ace. Ace was just a practical joker and always lots of fun. Another story that Ace, and Ace has many of them, but one other I can think of is the time in Stockholm. When the promoter decided that it was a night out, he should take us out to dinner, and there was a unique club. And in this particular restaurant club, they had a pool in the middle of it. And everyone that sat around the tables around the pool had a little remote control unit, and you could have your own little shrimp boat that would come out of the kitchen, and you'd guide it to your table full of fresh shrimp, and you'd eat it. Then you'd send your boat back to the kitchen, it'd fill it up with shrimp again, and you'd bring it to your table. Well, the promoter thought we should all loosen up a bit, and he introduced us to a drink called Jägermeister's. Well, the Jägermeister was not popular at that time, certainly not in the States, and we had no idea what it was. Oh, the promoter did. He thought it would loosen everyone up and everyone would have a great time. Well, it certainly did loosen us up. Uh, by the time we finished, Ace was walking around the pool, picking up the radio control boats, and hand-delivering the shrimp to everyone's table. Well, the, the owner of the club was a little crazy. He thought Ace would be falling through the pool, which was made of fiberglass, and about three feet off the ground. So he saw Ace and his feet going through the bottom of the pool and wrecking his pool. But we finally got Ace out of the pool and back to the hotel, and we had one raucous night. Uh, let's see if we can think of one more Ace story I can tell you. Oh, yes, there's one when I was heading up to Ace's house in Connecticut. And Ace had just finished this underground studio, and we would do demos there, of new songs and so forth. We called it Ace's Bunker. And we'd go down up to Ace. You never really quite knew what was going to happen. And one day I'm driving up going down Ace's driveway, and I get buzzed by a helicopter. It was a pretty good-sized helicopter. I mean, it, was, it would really shook me up because I didn't quite understand what was happening. And Ace used to have these radio control helicopters. And he'd come down his driveway, and he'd hide behind the house or in a bush someplace, and he would buzz your car as you came down his driveway. Well, you never knew what you were going to have when you met Ace or when you were at his house, but it was always fun. Kiss had done about nine albums, and and we also did Kiss Meets the Phantom, the first movie that they had ever done, which put a lot of strain on, on the group. Uh, it's a lot harder doing a movie than it was doing an album. One of the things that came out of this was that uh, Peter and Ace especially, and also Gene and Paul, had thought it might be time to do solo albums. Well, we weren't sure whether we were going to do four solo albums or one or two or one at a time. But as it happens, we decided to do four thinking it would be a unique way of promoting KISS. Also, it had never been done before. And we decided at that same time that if they were ready, we would put them all out at the same time. So effectively, it would be one huge KISS album with separate solo albums. After finishing the solo albums, getting ready to release them all at once was quite a procedure. We had to do different ads, announcing the release of the four solo albums, and then the planned announcements of them going gold and then platinum. As it happens, when we first released them, the first ad, instead of saying announcing the solo albums by Kiss, the wrong ad went out first and said they were already gold. Well, they hadn't even been released yet. So this kind of stirred the industry a bit. Then we had to actually ship the albums and start promoting the albums. At the beginning, everyone was so excited about the solo albums, Neil Bogart had decided to press over a million units apiece. This was more records than had been pressed for any album at that time, certainly for a release of any one album, never mind about releasing four albums at once. 
So many albums eventually got to the stores that the word on the street was there'll be more albums coming back than they were actually pressed. And there was, a, there was an awkward time for the group and for the record label. There were many complications with the release of the solo albums. One were the advertisements. They had come out in the, in the wrong order. Instead of the release of the albums, it, the first ad came out saying they were already gold. On top of that, the amount of pressings of the albums were uniquely high. It was over a million units of every album already pressed, and most of them were being sent to the stores, the large record stores and stores all over the country. So the word on the street was that more albums would come back than were actually pressed. It kept looking like we weren't selling any records. There were so many albums in every store that the piles and piles of records looked like they would never be sold. So the word in the industry was that the albums actually weren't making it and weren't being sold, and that effectively could, could have been a flop. The truth of the matter is, they all sold over a million units, and eventually were one of the most successful group of solo albums ever released in the record industry. Gene Simmons. Well, there's a one of a kind. Gene was really the driving force behind KISS, uh, keeping at it uh, day and night uh, ever since I met him back in 73. One of the things Gene had a problem with, though, was doing interviews for KISS. He always sounded like a school teacher to us, and all of us kind of got after him over and over again. He's a rock star. He had to talk like a rock star. Well, he really couldn't ever get that through his head in the earlier days, so Paul, Peter, and Ace kind of ganged up on him and said, look it, if you're going to talk like a school teacher, we're then going to do the interview. So you can make a few sounds and grunts and groans and every once in a while say something short, Gene. Remember, short, Gene, but we're going to be the rock and rollers and we'll talk for you. So, so ever since that moment in time, Gene has always been pretty much the quiet one, certainly in rock and roll interviews. One of the things that happened, I thought, when uh, that actually bothered Gene and Paul, as a matter of fact, was a famous interview with the Tom Snyder show. Uh, they were excited about doing this network television show with Tom Snyder and a little concerned about what Ace and Peter would say. And before the show, the, the associate producers of the show would go and interview the different people that were going to be on the show. And, of course, they came and they interviewed Gene and Paul and Peter and Ace. Well, they went back with notes for Tom on all four characters, and they went something like this. Oh, Gene, very, very good talker and very bright and able to answer almost any question. Paul will answer uh, any question, too, very communicative. And uh, uh, Peter's a little quiet, but okay, and Ace won't talk at all. Well, the truth of the matter is the day that they went to interview Ace, Ace was feeling pretty good had had a few drinks and was kind of a little out of it, so he really didn't want to do any pre-interview with any associate producer, so he basically didn't say very much, and that's the notes that got back to Tom Snyder. The, night, the day of the show, when we arrived at the NBC uh, studios, Ace was feeling great. He had had a great day, and he was in top form. We had bought a bottle of champagne, was back in the dressing room. We had a few sips of the bottle of champagne. Ace was in true, true form. In any case, by the time we went and did the show that night, uh, Ace was feeling really good, still in great shape and in a great, great mood. So we went to sit down, and of course Tom started interviewing Gene and Paul first, going along with the notes from his associate uh, producers that said that Peter and Ace probably wouldn't say very much, Ace definitely wouldn't say anything, so not to talk too much to those two characters. All of a sudden, Ace started coming alive. So Tom started looking at Ace, and started asking him a few questions. Well, Ace started to burst out in laughter, and just started discussing Kiss. With, with Tom Snyder, and at the point where Gene and Paul started to give him dirty looks. Well, how dare he start talking like this and start laughing and carrying on on television. Meanwhile, Tom Snyder started to think that maybe this was a joke being played on him by his staff. After all, they told him Ace wasn't going to talk at all, and now Ace was telling jokes, laughing, and discussing everything with Tom. Well, we go to commercial, and uh, Gene comes over and says, Bill, you've got to do something about Ace. You know, he's just getting carried away, and, and you've got to tell him to, to be quiet. 
Well, of course, I thought Ace was doing a great job. And it was a lot of fun to see him come to life, and Tom Snyder was enjoying him as well. So it really became the Ace uh, show that night and turned out to be maybe a cla- one of the classic interviews that Kiss ever did. Well, you know, the solo albums had come and gone, and it was time to do another Kiss record. Uh, and the next record uh, was Dynasty. Dynasty was a unique record only because it was uh, the guys getting back together again after all sorts of traumas that happened with the solo albums. And now we had to decide on a producer. Well, as it happens, the, the producer that finally turned out to do uh, Dynasty was Vinny Poncia uh, for a number of reasons. One, uh, Peter had used him for a solo album. And he had refused to do the next album unless he could use Vinnie Poncia. Well, Vinny, we all like Vinny a lot, and so Vinny became the producer of record. Uh, the next thing was to find the music, uh, and the music uh, obviously was written by Kiss, uh, but one song we needed uh, to fulfill the, our obligations to Casablanca was a disco song. Well, none of us really wanted to do a disco song, but Casablanca had become famous for doing disco records, and uh, Donna Summer was on the label and so forth and so on, but uh, so we decided to do a disco record called I Was Made For Loving You, which, which uh, ironically turned out to be probably the second most played single that Kiss had ever done, the first being Beth, and the second being I Was Made For Loving You, a world hit and followed us around the world as we did the world tour. The Dynasty show turned out to be the biggest Kiss show we had ever done. Uh, it, it took 16 semis to travel around the United States. It was a monstrous show with a very large crew. And we put it together in Lakeland, Florida, and we finally started the show, doing the first couple of shows in Florida and then moving up the East Coast. When we get to Atlanta, I had already flown back to the offices in New York, and I got a call from the head production manager. The production manager let me know that after tonight's show, they were quitting. They were quitting because the show was too big, it should have never come on the road, and it was impossible to do. Well, I got on a plane and flew to Atlanta right away, and I came into the, into the Omni, which was the arena that we were doing the show in, and the head of production manager came over to me and said, Bill, look, at this is impossible. The show just doesn't work. It's way too big. And I'm really telling you that after tonight, we're, we're all quitting. It just can't be done. And I, I said, well, okay, let me think about it. And I said, we'll have a meeting to talk it over in 15 minutes. You get all your crews together. Now, knowing that I couldn't very well take the Kiss show off the road, it was costing millions of dollars to put it on, I had to find some way to get through that evening and convince people that we could do the show. So we gathered all our production crew together, and as I'm talking about the show, I started to realize that the show was obviously very big, but that no one had ever seen the show. We had rehearsed it for weeks, but it was so complicated. Each, predic- each particular person had its own idea of what they had to do, but never had seen the show put together because they were too busy working on their own little departments. So I finally started explaining the show to them. Everyone looked at me with this blank stare saying, yeah, is that the way it's supposed to be? I said, well, tonight, look, at here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through the show step by step. You know, and at the end of the night, we'll, you'll see that the show can work and how exciting it can be and how it could stay on the road. Well, there was a lot of hemming and hawing. We went through every, everything about the show step by step again. We went through all the, all the pyros, all the, all the stage sets, every change in the show, where the music, why it was supposed to happen, what was supposed to happen in every section of the show. Everyone seemed to understand I told him to go out and check everything out. Everyone went out and checked. We came back. We had one more meeting. Finally, that night, they got to see the show because everyone was aware of something that I had never expected during rehearsals, which was that no one ever got to see the show. And they finally saw it that night in Atlanta. It went off perfectly, and everyone decided to keep the show on the road. Now, let me tell you about some of the things that never made the show. Uh, There was a a couple of laser uh, effects that we wanted. One was a huge laser setup that was underneath the stage that at one part of the show would put laser bars completely around the stage so it would look like Kiss was in a cage, a laser cage. Well, we spent an enormous amount of money at that time. I think it cost uh, about $150,000, $200,000 to have this one effect, which the day that we set up didn't work. And we... And it was, oh, it was a horrible story, everyone complaining and everything else. And we finally had to a, had a fire the laser company and... 
And, of course, everyone was a little down about that. And one of the other effects that was supposed to be part of this was a laser beam that would come out of Paul's eye. We were going to have a fiber optic cord running along with a guitar cord, and it would run up through his costume and out behind his ear so that the laser beam would look like it's coming directly out of his eye. And uh, it was scrapped also at the last minute because Paul was afraid it would damage his eye. So that's one effect you never got to see. Now, let's talk about one other thing. I mean, all of you know that I figured that Gene had so much presence on stage and had so much to do that I really had to balance it out by giving Paul something to do and something that would look great for him. I initially thought that would have Paul fly from the stage to the lighting grid, where he would sing one of his songs. And it would just fulfill that part of the show and balance off uh, what Gene had on the other side of the stage. Uh, when I described it to Paul, he listened carefully and then told me, no, he didn't think so. He thought he'd be too scared to fly from the stage and the wires, would they hold him? Wouldn't they hold him? And there would be too many complications. Of course, the minute he said no, Gene raised his hand and said, I'll do it. As always, Gene felt anything else he could do on stage, he would do and usually did. So anyway, that was the story about how Gene finally got to fly to the lighting grid. Uh, the Dynasty Tour, as I mentioned before, was a huge, huge tour in the sense of the type of people, the stage set, and the complete show. As the show continued and as we traveled around the world, uh, it was becoming obvious that the show was so big that unless we really sold out every show, there was not going to be a lot of money made on the tour. This became a problem at the end of the tour, certainly for me and, and, uh, and for the group based on the fact that their business managers at the time kept telling them they're not making money on tours. Uh, there was a lot of complications, I think, that came from this. One, the tours, this particular tour didn't sell out, probably because the Dynasty album wasn't one of their biggest selling albums. Uh, we had just done the solo albums, uh, there was an awful lot of Kiss product out there. And although we had a, a hit song on the Dynasty album, which was I Was Made for Loving You, it was really bigger outside the United States than it was inside the United States. So that overall, the album sales were down slightly, and the attendance on the show was, were down, and therefore we didn't get to make the profits that uh, certainly their business managers wanted them to make. Peter Chris. Well, Peter Chris is a true rock and roller. If there was ever a rock and roller, someone meant to be, Peter certainly has been there. Done everything and certainly had his ups and downs in life, but is truly uh, the ultimateness in what you'd feel as a rock and roller. Uh, Peter, Peter could also be very emotional, uh, very sensitive, very emotional. You could say something to Peter who would, that would either be very up or very down, depending on how he took it that day. And, uh, but there were a lot of things that would happen. Uh, because he was so emotional, sometimes he would, uh, he would do things to, to get attention, but uh, sometimes he would hit his hand on something because he, he'd say, oh my goodness, you're the drummer, Peter. Why did you do that? Well, you know, I'm not sure today. I really can do this today. And uh, he'd go through some heavy emotions. But he would, also be, he would also be a wild one. I remember one great party that Peter threw in his house up in Connecticut and uh, when we were all kind of, we had great food and uh, lots of people were there. And it was just one of the best parties we had had. And all of a sudden, Ace comes to me and says, I think Peter is shooting his gun. And I said, you know, what's that sound? Is that, he said, oh, I think Peter's shooting his gun. And I said, oh, no, 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 we're in the house. Well, sure enough, Peter comes downstairs. And as he's coming down the stairs, he's shooting his gun into the ceiling. And you can imagine people jumping over chairs, jumping behind couches, running into the kitchen, running out of the house. And, uh, well, that was just one party. There was many others that were even wilder. Uh, Peter, always the, always the crazy rock and roller. I can remember this story while we were in Germany. I think it was Frankfurt. But anyway, we were in Germany, and, and one night late about, two in the morning, I get a call from the road manager. Have you seen Peter? I said, no. Is he in his room? No. Well, he must have left the hotel. No, he didn't leave the hotel. Well, maybe he found someone else. Maybe he's in someone else's room. Well, we've looked everywhere. I said, well, okay, let me come up to his room. I'll meet you at his room. I walk into his room, and the room doesn't exist anymore. There's an anwa that's smashed. All the, all the Mirrors are gone. The lighting fixtures are off the wall. I said, oh, my God, he's having one heck of a rock and roll party. Well, we hunted around the hotel some more, and I noticed that one of the windows was open. 
And I said, you don't think he could be walking outside on the, on the ledge, do you? Well, well, anything's possible with Peter. Maybe he decided to walk out on the ledge. Well, sure enough, we looked outside, and nine stories up on the ledge on the side of the hotel, Peter was out there singing and having a great time. Well, we coaxed him in and finally went to bed for the evening. One of the great moments that uh, we've had with Peter was certainly around the song Beth. And in fact, Beth turned out to be a lifesaver for us. Uh, Peter had come up with a song that everyone thought might work, and especially the producer, Bob Ezrin, who said, you know, we could use a song like this on the album. So Peter and Bob finished the song, and it turned out to be not only a major success for us, but it also helped the Destroyer album become a major album. It was the biggest single that, that the group has ever had, and uh, it was because of Peter Chris, because Peter came up with an idea and a song that initially uh, the guys really didn't want on the album. Uh, Gene and Paul thought it wasn't a Kiss song, and it wasn't, certainly wasn't a typical Kiss song. However, at uh, listening to it, I knew it had to be on the album, and uh, it certainly struck me as a possible single. And it went on the album, and it turned out to be not only the biggest success they've had as a single, but it saved and promoted the Destroyer album all over the world. Oh, there was one night at a concert when someone threw a cherry bomb on stage and it landed right beside Peter's drums. And I see Peter fall off his stand. And I'm saying, oh, my goodness. You know, and everyone's panicking. We help Peter off the stage. And, of course, the audience knew it and everything. And, and there's an ambulance that's backing up to the backstage area and Peter's being carried out. And now we're on our way to the hospital. And he looks up at me and he says, Bill... Do you think we should do the rest of the show? <laughs> I said, yeah, I think so. He said, well, turn this thing around. Well, he turned it around. He comes back to the stage, and we finish the show. Uh, as always, Peter could be very, very emotional. And, uh, and during those times, it was it, between the partying and some of the drugs and everything else that were being taken, Peter would be extreme. And Gina Paul came to me and said, look, I think, I think people are going to have to replace Peter. I didn't think it was necessarily the right thing to do at that time. I had hoped that we'd give him a chance to, to help himself first, but it didn't seem to get any better, and Peter at the time was also in the middle of getting married, and it seemed to be so, so emotional that we had many, many meetings uh, between uh, the four of us, uh, Ace, Paul, Gene, and myself. Uh, Ace and I were on one side, and, and Gene and Paul were on the other side. Uh, the decision was finally made, and we had that final meeting with Peter after he came back from his honeymoon and told him what was going to happen. Uh, obviously, he was very hurt, and uh, Gene and Paul left the meeting after, after telling him, and uh, he turned around to Ace and asked Ace if that's what he felt, and Ace reluctantly said yes. And... Um, we finally left Peter alone to ponder what was happening, and uh, it was a very sad and emotional day. Looking for a new drummer? Well, it was time. We knew we had to face it. Uh, we had to find a new drummer. Peter was gone, and the trauma of settling in to find a new drummer turned out to be more, more of a chore than anyone expected. Hundreds of drummers we went through. We used to set up a a rehearsal, a rehearsal hall and had a drummer every half hour. We figured the drummer would play f for 15 or 20 minutes, we'd have to say hi, we'd have to say goodbye, we'd have to be nice to them, we'd have to shuffle them out and get the next drummer in. So we figured about a, a half hour to 40 minutes per drummer. And we went through oh, drummer after drummer after drummer, realizing that, of course, we couldn't use anyone that was already known because... Uh, if everyone already knew them, he couldn't be part of KISS, certainly not if they knew his face. So we kept looking for new drummers, and uh, most of them weren't up to the level that we needed. Plus, the personality was important. Don't forget, this drummer had to put up makeup every single day for the most part, had to hide his face all the time, and had to be part of a group that was already established and come in as a new member. As we went along, we found this one guy, Eric Carr. Eric was a sweetheart. Uh, played very well, didn't seem to have an overpowering ego, and the guys thought they could get along with him and, and liked his drumming. So we finally signed Eric, 
Eric didn't become a full member of KISS. He was a hired hand, but he was a terrific person. And to, to give him a little feel of what a rock and roller was like, we bought him a new Porsche and gave him a fairly good sized salary for joining KISS. The guys didn't really want to make another full partner with the group KISS, and he, he really remained a hired hand to the very end. We had some trouble getting ready for the first show. Uh, it was only weeks away at the Palladium in New York City. And the reason we wanted to have this show, it was only one show in the United States, uh, we were getting ready to do a European tour, but we needed some way to announce the new drummer, the name and the character to the American press to get ready for the tour in the United States. And we also needed a full dress rehearsal with audience to make sure everything was running smoothly. And that was the night at the Palladium. Before the Palladium show, there were plenty of problems to overcome. Uh, we didn't know what character Eric was going to be. Couldn't be the cat, because the cat was Peter Chris. So we had to come up with a new character and a new costume. Well, it seemed like it would be pretty easy, but effectively, after we got involved with it, it was a lot harder than we thought. Was he going to be a chicken? Was he going to be a hawk? Was he, go was he going to be a chipmunk? We had no idea what he was going to be like. And as the days got closer and closer and closer, it got worse. Paul and Jean got scared about uh, what was going to happen. Was it going to happen? Where are we going to finish it? Where did we have the costume? Is the makeup going to work? And I remember at the last minute, the day before the show, where we were rehearsing the songs and trying to finish up everything, Jean and Paul and I had our first real argument upstairs in the dressing room at the Palladium. Uh, them s stating very clearly to me that I was the manager, I'd better get it together and make sure that he was ready for tomorrow night's show, or that was it. And they just stormed out of the dressing room. Well, Eric and I spent most of the night uh, getting ready for this, finishing up a costume that wasn't quite done yet, deciding what the final touches of the makeup was and what he was going to be, and getting ready for the next day. Literally stayed up all night working on this, and by the next day, it was done. He was the fox, we had the outfit, and he was ready to go, and the makeup was set. Uh, the next day it turned out to be a little exasperating, only because, of course, it was the first time in the announcement of the new drummer, as well as the only show we were playing for all the press and the key KISS fans in the United States before we went to Europe. The show turned out spectacularly well, Eric did a great job, and we were on our way to Europe. A couple of interesting stories that happened on that European tour. Uh, one happened in Milan, Italy. There was a communist de demonstration that were going through the streets of Milan when we arrived, and there was plenty of talk about it, both in the papers and on television and around the hotels. And we were going to the soccer stadium where we were playing the first show, and the crowds had started to come in and mill around, and, and we had already set up the stage and everything else, and all of a sudden, the group was, was walking back and forth, and they heard a fight had broken out. Well, they were behind the stage, and they could hear the people starting to scuffle, then swear, and then the fight would break out, and the bottles would be thrown and everything else. Well, they thought there was going to be a full-scale riot. They ran back down through the tunnel in the middle of the stadium and back to the dressing room. So I, I stayed out there to see what was going to happen, knowing that we pretty much had enough crew to take care of it, and then I walked down through the tunnel, under the ground, and wound up at the dressing room. When I got to the dressing room, the door was barricaded. And I had to tell him many times, it was really Bill, I'm the manager, remember me? <laughs> Knocked on the door until they finally unbarricaded the door and let me in. Well, many discussions unfolded then. One was, we're not going to play. Two was, we're not leaving the dressing room. How are we going to get out of here alive? And so forth. And my only comeback on that was, that I thought we had more firepower than anyone in the audience. One of the best tours uh, that we ever had, I believe, was the first time to Australia. That was in the beginning of the 80s. Uh, we had a number of things that made it certainly great. We had our own plane, our nine limousines, our own helicopter, as well as uh, some terrific parties. The Australians are a lot of fun to be with. In fact, the parties were so great that... Uh, we drank all the Dom Perignon there was in Australia. 
Uh, all the champagne in Australia, uh, certainly the Dom Perignon, especially because Ace liked that. We used to load the planes up and have them at every party. In fact, the nights that we didn't have pl- parties, which were few and far between, uh, we'd open Bill's Bar. Bill's Bar became a, a special event when there weren't any other parties. We'd all feel like we'd have to continue because, after all, once in a party mood, always in a party mood. So I would, I would open Bill's Bar any time there wasn't a party, and I would be the bartender. And then we'd invite people from the hotel or fans that we met along the way all to come and join us at the hotel on the opening of Bill's Bar. The shows in Australia were, were the biggest that uh, had ever been brought to Australia. We were playing stadiums with, a, with a, one of the largest KISS shows. The press used to follow us around every day in Australia. We were in the front of the newspapers. Uh, there were major events the, when we first arrived in Sydney uh, with the mayor giving us the key to the city. Uh, we had, we had uh, television stations and, and radio stations as well as the top reporters who actually flew with us all around Australia. And there was also some controversy. There was a reverend who had talked about Kiss being uh, the Knights of Satan service, which followed us around every once in a while, and had uh, made a big statement in, in the national newspaper about Kiss being evil. So we decided to show them that we certainly weren't evil, and that was never really the case. We decided to dress up and go and visit the children's hospital the next day. And that was a terrific day. I mean, the kids loved it, so I think we finally put that to rest. We had a promotion guy who was with a record company, and he was a little bit of a nerd. I mean, he just he had to have his way about everything and kept bugging us about everything and everything else. And So afterwards, I said, you know, we need, we need to relax, and let's make sure we keep the pool at the hotel open late. So you arrange for that. So, oh, all right, all right, all right, all right. And, and of course... And, of course, he felt that, you know, there'll be, there'll be women there, there'll be partying, it'll be great, we'll have the pool open late, and so forth. So we were pretty tired of this guy. And uh, Paul decides, well, I'll think of something. And uh, the guy, we're back at the pool. The guy hasn't come up yet. He's downstairs at the bar having a drink. And um, Paul takes a poop in the pool, the old poop in the pool trick. In any case, uh, it, the poop is lying at the bottom of the pool, and the guy comes in, the promotion guy from the record label, and Paul goes up to him and says, you know, he says, I can't believe it. I just dropped my watch in the pool. And now this guy, whose ego is bigger than all the group together, says, don't worry, Paul. So he dives to the bottom of the pool, and of course, what he got was a handful of poop. One of the parties we threw in Australia was a, a big gathering in Sydney, and Elton John was in town doing a tour. So we invited Elton to come and join us and so forth. Well, I have to tell you, Elton was having a party the next night. But we were so rowdy the first night, he told the record company after the party, make sure you don't invite those KISS guys to my party. After Unmasked, the guys decided to take some time off. Uh, there was a lot of emotions between Peter leaving and and go, doing the next record or not and when and so forth. We knew that the record company needed another record, but no one was in the mood to either write one and or record one. As the pressure came down on us to come up with a new album, and I realized the guys weren't writing, or did they feel like uh, recording a new album? And I thought the only person that I knew that knew them well enough and could get us through this was Bob Ezrin, an incredibly bright producer who was capable of helping them write as well as producing the album. Well, when we started to think about doing another Kiss album, no one was very much into it, And we came up with an idea, hopefully, that would help us and would get us through this problem. And the idea was to do a concept album. That concept album turned out to be The Elder. Now, The Elder was done helter-skelter. It was really a rough one to do. It was not easy in any respects. The songs were hard to write. Uh, No one was in the mood to do it. Uh, Barb was frustrated by it. Both Gene and Paul were. Uh, Ace really didn't want to do it, and he didn't want to work with Bob. He had had a, an argument over something that had happened in the Destroyer album, so Bob was not his favorite producer at that point. And we, we started off uh, with the album and, and dragged ourselves through it, and we finally finished it. And I must say that it's certainly a unique album, but most people don't consider it a Kiss album.
Uh, we delivered it to the record label, and the record label hated it. In fact, when we first played it for them, they just said, look it, why don't we can this album and do another album? Well, the thought of that was definitely not going to happen. It was hard enough just to get this album done. And that was really kind of the beginning of the end, both uh, with me and Kiss, uh, and for a number of things. Uh, they had decided that they were going to, they wanted to take off their makeup. Uh, I was certainly against that. I thought that we had spent too much time protecting their makeup uh, legally and through the Library of Congress, which, which was the first time any rock and roll act had ever been uh, copywritten. Their faces were copywritten in the Library of Congress. It took us years to do that. So when they decided they wanted to take off their makeup and they weren't happy with the elder, um, no one was happy with it at that time. So we had had a couple of meetings about whether we were going to stay together or not. And finally one day, Gene and Paul walked into my office and said, Well, Bill, I think the time has come. And we had talked about everything and how we began. And we wound up uh, actually with tears in our eyes at the end. But we decided to part that it was the time. They needed to go on and do what they wanted to do. And I needed to do what I had to do. <laughs> 